Now, I know I have a small voice, so can you hear me okay? And will you shout if you can't? I'm delighted to have a microphone. It makes all the difference. Um, it's really lovely to be here today. We had no idea who to expect, how many people to expect, so it's nice to see so many of you. Um, as uh, Aggie says, I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Support, which is much more of a mouthful than my uh, previous job title, which was Director of Communications, much easier. And uh, same goes for Elena. She used to be um, just customer support, but we um, just recently brought those two teams together because we increasingly realized how important it is um, you know, that the sort of technology and the communications actually really need to be firmly linked together um, in an organization like ours. So I wanted to start by just finding out a bit about all of you. So I'm going to ask you a few questions, and it will really help if you could um, stick your hand up. So how many students have we got here? If any few, great. Any um, researchers? Yep. Research managers? Okay. Library people? Okay, so good mix. That's great. And how many of you know anything at all about ORCID? Not many. Does anybody have an ORCID ID already? A couple of you, a few of you, okay. And those of you that do, have you used it at all? Um, yep. Great. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good to know that somebody's already out there using it. So we're going to start with, um, I'm going to do a little bit of um, introduction to uh, who ORCID is, you know, what, what we do, who we are, why we, and most importantly, why we do it. And then I'm going to hand over to Elena, who's going to do a live demo for you of just how easy it is to create your very own ORCID ID, why you should do it, and once you've got it, what you can do with it and why. So we'll start with a, with a sort of basic introduction to what we do. So I think, um, if you stop and think about it, we'd all agree that names are messy. Whether it's names for people or places or things, you can have one thing with multiple names or multiple things with um, lots of different names or multiple things that mean this different, different things. Um, when it comes to organizations, you can have an organization that uh, is known by its acronym, like University of Western Australia, UWA. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's other UWAs out there in other parts of the world that your organization probably gets confused with. The same goes for people. There's um, you know, people that share the same name, sometimes thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people with the same name. Um, even if you don't share the exact same name, you may publish or, or work under different variations of your name. Your name may change. So there's lots of reasons why names are messy. So how do we go about cleaning them up? Can we do so? Well, yes, we can. If we think about names as um, digital identifiers, we can assign a unique identifier to each name that takes away that ambiguity and that uniquely specifies the person or the organization or the object to which the name refers. So that's our vision, really, and we're all about the people part of this. So our vision is a world where all researchers can be uniquely identified and connected with their contributions, and, and contributions is an important distinction to make. So this isn't just about journal articles. This is about any kind of research or scholarly uh, contribution that you make, and that this will happen across time and disciplines and borders. So it doesn't matter where you are in your career, where you are in the world, or where you are in terms of your, your discipline or field, your ORCID ID is always going to stay the same. So as I say, we're all about persistent identifiers for people. And just to kind of reiterate, the, so um, a couple of examples. The group on the left-hand side, four lovely people, who um, three of them share what in Chinese is our different names, but if they were published in English, they would probably be identical, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them necessarily. And then conversely, on the right-hand side, you've got four Japanese researchers who will share the exact same name, and it would be very easy to confuse them as well. But by using their ORCID ID, which is the, n the numbers on the left, so these 16-digit um, unique identifiers, which are compliant with other, other standards around the world, um, like the ISNI standard, um, you can digitally make sure that they, you are connecting the right person with the right works. So what is ORCID then? Well, as I say, we provide these persistent digital identifiers to uniquely distinguish each researcher or contributor. And really importantly, we work with other organizations to embed those identifiers in the workflows that you're using. So it might be a publishing workflow, you're submitting a journal article or a book. 
It might be a grant award, you're, asking, you're, you're applying for a grant. It might be in your institution, anything from the HR system to the library to the institutional repository to the faculty profile system. Any system that you're using, we want ORCID IDs to be embedded in to make those connections between the different systems. Now you may have already, in fact I'm pretty sure that you do all have at least one identifier that you're using professionally because I'm pretty sure that within the university you must have at least one identifier that you're using. You very likely have multiple ones both within the university but also outside in your professional life. So um, I expect, do any of you have a, an academia.edu profile or a ResearcherGate pro, research profile or a Researcher ID profile? So all of those are different sorts of IDs that you already have. And What's different about ORCID is that we kind of, we, uh, if you like, transcend all of them. So those are all either proprietary um, IDs, so something like ResearchGate or Researcher ID is proprietary to the system that it's in, Researcher ID is proprietary to Thomson Reuters, so you can use it in their systems, but you can't use it outside of them. Your university ID works just fine while you're at UWA, but if you were to move down the road to Curtin, you wouldn't be able to use it, you couldn't take it with you. So all the information that you connected to that ID would be, would be lost to you, basically. Um, and similarly, you, if you are using Researcher ID and then you're in your ResearchGate profile, you can't make a connection between those two. So what we do is we act as a hub between all those different systems and we, together with other persistent identifiers, whether for organizations or DOIs for articles or um, some of these other um, people IDs, we work with them um, to connect uh, in a machine readable way, make connections between all your different uh, versions of your name, versions of where you work, versions of what you've, what you've um, published and so on. So how we like to think of this is that we provide part of the plumbing uh, for research information. So it's not a very sexy analogy perhaps, so plumbing is one of those things that you really, really need. You typically only notice it when it doesn't work, um, but it's really vital to, to enabling you to do what you need to do. And we work with many other organizations, including the ones um, shown here. And the idea is that through providing a really stable um, research infrastructure, we can help to build trust in digital inf information so we can help people feel confident that, you know, the Jane Smith over here really is the Jane Smith over there um, and make that connection. And ultimately what we want to do is to reduce the reporting um, and admin burden on faculty, students and staff. I'm sure all of you have to re-enter the same information time and time again in different systems and our, our ultimate goal is to, is to uh, make that a thing of the past so that you basically enter your information once and then you can reuse it often in lots of different systems by making those connections. I'm just going to pause for a minute. Are there any questions from anybody? Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to talk just a little bit now about why ORCID from a research perspective. And we did a, quite a big survey last year. We had about 6,000 responses from all over the world. Um, and we wanted to really understand what people already knew and understood about ORCID, what they liked and didn't like, what else they wanted to do with, or wanted ORCID to do, what they expected ORCID to be able to do for them. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I have pulled out some of the survey responses that I thought you might be interested in in terms of researcher benefits. And I've also broken out um, so that so the number the first number is the global response, and the second number is the response in Australia and New Zealand. So you can see there's actually. Um, in, for the most part, higher awareness in your region of ORCID and what we are, who we do, why we do it, than there is in the, in the world overall. So this is my favorite, really, response from the um, survey. One of the questions we asked was why people um, thought you should have an ORCID ID, and there were various options. And this was the top one um, that people selected most often, was I want the internet to work better and persistent identifiers are the way to go. And we were quite surprised that this was, um, this, there was such strong support for this answer because it's, you know, it's quite a sophisticated answer, but the vast majority of the people answering this question were researchers. Um, and I, we were really um, heartened by the fact that so many researchers understand that actually persistent identifiers in one form or another are really important to making the internet, internet work well. A few facts and figures about us. We are very, very close to hitting 2 million registrants um, for, for ORCID IDs. Uh, I think we're at about 1.97 or something like that. Uh, we're hoping that we might make it by the end of this month. We kind of hoped we might make it this week because uh, we had an outreach meeting in Canberra early this week and it would have been awesome to get to 2 million for that, but we didn't quite make it. 
Um, we have, as of the end of last year, we had 465 organizational members, of whom uh, UWA is one. We're thrilled. Thank you. And you're actually part of a, an Australian national consortium, which is even better. Uh, about two-thirds of our members are research institutions such as yours, over half in Europe. Um, we've had a big push in Europe for the last couple of um, years. We've had a regional director base there. But we now have a regional director based in Asia Pacific, who Elena works very closely with. Um, our colleague Nobuko Miyari is based in Japan. And she's really um, going to be doing a lot of work this year in terms of outreach, working with Elena um, uh, in this region. We have four national consortia, including the Australian one three regional in the US and very importantly we have over 225 live integrations now some of these are pretty basic integrations where people are just collecting ORCID IDs in their systems and not really doing anything very much with them but we also have some really great integrations for example with um, Crossref who I don't know whether are any of you familiar with Crossref for those of you that are not Crossref itself doesn't have great brand um, visibility but what they do does I expect that more of you have heard of DOIs yes um, so Crossref is the main scholarly pub um, publishing orga main organization that provides DOIs for scholarly publishers so for journal articles book chapters books images and all the rest that are used by scholarly publishers so um, if you hear if you hear the name Crossref they're a really great organization that does a version of what we do but for for research works basically and they have recently done a fabulous integration with us where if you use your ORCID ID when you publish a paper um, and the publisher will then submit it with the metadata through to Crossref when, when Crossref mints the DOI for your paper they'll push it back into your record automatically and if you give them permission to do so they'll do that for any publisher where you use your ORCID ID anytime you publish so you imagine you never potentially going forward you might never have to update your ORCID record again you can just have it automatically updated every time you publish and even better from the university's point of view and actually from yours as well is that the university can then opt to have updates every time you publish and have their systems updated as well so then you really don't have to not only do you not have to update your ORCID record but much more importantly you don't have to update your university record because it will already already have been updated for you oh sorry I should have said um, we also have now at least eight funders requiring ORCID IDs for grantees so these include a couple of quite big ones like the Wellcome Trust in the UK um, and so they are saying that if you want to apply for a grant in order to submit your application you have to use an ORCID ID Similarly, 15 publishers and possibly more to join um, signed an open letter earlier this year committing themselves to requiring ORCID IDs for at least the contributing author or the corresponding author um, for accepted um, articles. So out in sort of the broader scholarly ecosystem, more organizations are starting to recognize the value of ORCID and to require um, or certainly request if not require it from you so it's something that again you just need to be aware of and look out for that little green um, icon because that is typically going to mean we want we either want you to use your ORCID ID or somebody else has used their ORCID ID here just quickly a bit more on um, ORCID in Asia Pacific so the Australian consortium is by far the biggest um, group that we're working with in the region but and we've got a smattering of um, members in other areas but we are hoping to grow quite significantly this year but Australia is really leading the way and we appreciate that so then just some quick um, benefits for researchers and again this includes the, the responses that we got from the survey so it's free it's always going to be free for you guys the researchers Any, anybody that wants to use an ID it's free for you um, and we are supported we're a, we're a membership organization as I said so we're supported by um, our member dues but from a from an end user point of view this is free for you I mentioned that it's a unique persistent open identifier and there's very high awareness of that and that that's a benefit something that you can take with you everywhere you travel throughout your career you know whether you change your name change your organization change your job change your discipline doesn't matter your ORCID ID is always going to stay the same it's time saving it's very easy to use you're going to see a great example of this shortly when Elena demos for you um, uh, uh, how to set up and, and use an ORCID ID and one thing we didn't specifically ask about in the survey but which is really really important for you all to know is that uh, one sort of other distinguishing feature about ORCID in addition to the fact that it's not proprietary that you can take it with you is the fact that 
you claim your record and you own your record. And so you get to choose who has access to it, what information you connect to it, of that information, what's publicly available versus privately available versus you allow people access to it. You can choose whether you allow an organization access to it once or um, sort of forever. So you stay in control. You're not going to, you're not going to find your, um, unless you give your institution or another trusted individual access to your record, nobody else is going to be able to choose what happens to it. Obviously, it enables uh, better discoverability and recognition. This is a great way of making sure that you get credit for the work that you've done because you're unambiguously you out there in the, in the community. And as I mentioned, it's increasingly being required by funders and publishers. And actually, we were surprised at the level of support for that in the community. There was very, very high support, 72% um, overall globally and 78% in this region for mandating ORCID in um, different systems. Um, and in fact, only 7% um, disagreed or disagreed strongly that it would be a good thing for the, for the scholarly community. These are the main use cases at the moment for how researchers are using ORCID, and publishing, not surprisingly, is the, is the main way. That's partly because publishers really led the way in terms of integrating with ORCID, and also because publishing, obviously, is such an important part of what you're doing. Um, slightly less awareness in this region than globally, uh, sl slightly less use, um, I should say, in this region than globally, according to the survey, but still about 50% of researchers here have used um, their ORCID ID in, in, a, in a publishing situation. Um, le less in your institution, so 28% in Australia and New Zealand, so again, this would be something like um, for a fac in a faculty profile system or something like that, and then lower again in terms of applying for grants. But with the funder mandates, that number is likely to increase. So really to reiterate, all you need to do is to get an ORCID ID, which Elaine is going to demo in a minute, is super easy, and then use it. So whenever you see this little nice green ORCID ID, that we want you to associate that with either being asked for information in a validated way that you can trust or it including information that you can trust about another researcher. So if you're prompted to use your ORCID ID, hopefully you will, maybe not at the moment, always see, but, in, but going forward the idea is that you will always see that little green icon and you'll know that's an indication that you're being asked to provide your ID or that somebody else has provided their ID. And you'll know that you can trust that, that um, as, a, as a way of um, knowing that the, the person at that ID um, is a, has, uh, the, the person whose ID that is owns it themselves and has been using it themselves. Okay. That's all from me. But um, are there any questions before we hand over to Elena? Does anybody, is that clear enough what we're all about, how we work? Um, anybody either who has or hasn't heard of ORCID before need any more information before we move on to the demo? Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Elena. And I'll log in as my public account if I remember the password, which is not likely. Oh, no, I remembered it. Wonderful. So here is a, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. This is an incorrectly listed researcher ID, but we're going to pretend that that's mine for today. Oh, wait, no, wait, this one might be mine. Okay. So your ORCID record can be as populated or as unpopulated as you want. Most of uh, researchers who do use ORCID are using it more to make connections rather than simply filling it out to be just another profile. Um, we have a number of ways that you can add information, though, to your record by making those connections. As we mentioned, or Alice mentioned the search and link tools, which because I have it so small is not working. There we go. We have a number of ways that you can connect to other databases. For example, let's say uh, Scopus to Orcus ID, which is not working very well right now. I apologize. If you are trying to use your ORCID record, you probably will not be able to use the Scopus to ID import wizard right now, and Scopus knows about this and is trying to fix it. Usually it's a very good one. So let's do crossref. Now, when you try to use the search and link wizards or any other search, uh, any other wizard to add to the account, as Alice mentioned, you're creating a connection and 
that entity will ask you to authorize the connection. Usually you can click authorize or you can click deny. If you click deny, something like this may happen. That's sad. So let's go back and click authorize. Now what I am doing here is I'm giving Crossref permission to both read my ORCID record, i.e. read any of my personal uh, publicly available information, as well as um, to post any items on there. This one is a very nice integration because if, say, this acknowledgments chapter published in the Politics of Appearances were written by me, all I would have to do would be to click to add to ORCID. It's not mine, so I won't do that. So let's just look for a test one. Yay, a component has published. So all you have to do is click Add to ORCID. Are you sure that you want to add the or this record to ORCID? And then once it actually processes, it will post. It's a bit slow. Now you'll see here, it says not visible. That is because when I signed up for my account, I set my privacy settings to be, um, things would be automatically either public, uh, sorry, trusted, limited access only, or private. When you would go back to your ORCID record, you would hopefully see it there. Let's make education small, employment small, and all my things, I'm so sorry. As you see, I put my entire publicated listings on there. But there it is, all the way at the bottom. It comes the source cross-ref metadata search along with the DOI. Very simple, and that's all you have to do to import it. I'm gonna delete that though because it's not mine. That's just one thing that you can do with your ORCID record. If, however, your institution we're setting up, say, an ORCID integration. You may be asked to, say, link your ORCID record, and it's essentially the same process as signing up. It's that instead of that way, your institution would be sending you a link like this to either get an ID or uh, log in using your existing ID, and you would just go through the same process. Generally, you wouldn't have to do anything more than that. You would just create the ID, Connected to or uh, connected to your university's account, and then only use it whenever you needed to use ORCID again. For example, at the manuscript submission process, it's generally very simple. All you have to do is just get it and then use it just when you're making those connections. And should you wish to fill it out more, then you can do so using um, procedures such as searching Crossref and the like. Um, let's see, what else needs to be known about the ORCID record? Ah, yes. Should you ever need any assistance with your ORCID record, you can go to our knowledge base, which you can access um, either by going to support at ORCID.org or clicking down here on the question mark and immediately asking a question. That question comes to me. Um, I am your Asia Pacific uh, regional support, uh, community engagement and support person. So I'm actually located in Hong Kong, so exactly the same time zone as you all. When you send queries to support at orchid.org, it comes to me or those are my colleagues uh, because I'm here on your time. And otherwise, you can get self service by going to our knowledge base. But really, all you have to do is just register. It was that quick and easy. So any particular questions that I can answer about managing your ORCID record or anything else that you might want to know about the specific ORCID record?